All right, cool. We'll, we'll get started. This is, I guess, for sort of stage presence and uh, authority yeah, projection. Um, there's, so we got a lot of people watching the live stream. Um, so hence the, the mic. And during the Q&A session, we'll try to run this around uh, to folks to ask questions. Um, but we're super excited to have Aaron Gustafson with us. Um, as you all know, Aaron is an expert uh, to say the least, on adaptive web design, responsive, progressive design, um, and he's the author of Adaptive Web Design, um, and all around good guy, as far as I can tell. Um, <laughs> uh, and and uh, Aaron recently joined Microsoft, where he's working with the browser team there on, uh, on web standards. So thanks again very much for being with us, Aaron. Yeah. Hand it over to you. Thank you. All right. So. Um, yeah, so my, my background's actually in the web standards world. Um, I used to be one of the managers of the web standards project. I've worked at a list of heart for a really long time as well. Um, and I just left an agency that I, I co-run or didn't didn't necessarily leave. Um, decided to kind of take a, a, a turn and go work for, for Microsoft to advocate for standards there and advocate for accessibility as well. Because uh, that's the stuff that I'm super passionate about. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about kind of going beyond the idea of responsive design because responsive design is very much about it's about accessibility fundamentally, right? It's about creating an accessible experience to somebody regardless of their device size, but it's very much focused on the visual design and relaying out things to be appropriate to a, a given screen size. And there are so many other considerations that we need to deal with in order to um, create experiences for users uh, throughout the world. So um, the slides for this talk are online um, at is.gd or uh, slash beyond underscore responsive underscore 18f. There's also a reading list if anybody's interested in that. Um, and I'll send that link to Nick as well uh, so that he can spread that around. And I think he sent the slide share out because I put these slides up there as well, which is where that link points to. Um, so anyway, starting foundationally, I think we'd all agree this is no longer the web, right? This is. Uh, you know, I, I remember when I worked at Gartner years ago, they actually had a ton of these SunSpark boxes. This was around like 2000, 2001. Um, we all had these giant CRTs. And, and in fact, I remember back when, I, before I came to the web, I was actually, I worked in print um, doing a magazine uh, that I started when I was in college. And I used to lug my, I think I had a, a compact Presario tower and like a, a big CRT monitor. And I would actually take that to Kinko's. I put it in my CRT monitor in with a seat belt and like drive it to the Kinkos in order to be able to plug it into their large format printer because they they could print 11 by 17 and I didn't have an 11 by 17 printer. Um, so I do that once a month, which was awesome. <laughs> um, but anyway, this isn't the web that we have anymore. I think we're all pretty uh, well familiar with that. Um, but I think that I, I stumbled on this blog post from Jason Samuels, who's the IT manager of the National Council on Family Relations. So this is a, an organization that helps families better relate to one another and, and establish better communication. And, and, and they, they do a lot of research in this area and provide a lot of knowledge for, for folks who are working in that space. Um, and he actually looked at their Google Analytics for originally a four-year period ranging from 2008 to 2012. So that was the period just after the launch of the iPhone, kind of the, the explosion of smartphones and the like. Um, and he, he was able to chronicle very uh, well just how things had changed for them. So, and this wasn't like a cutting edge, you know, Apple or an Amazon.com or something like that where, where they're going to be getting, you know, lots of people going on the latest and greatest flagship devices and stuff like that. This is just, you know, a, a, a nonprofit <laughs> organization. Um, but so they, they had most people in 2008 were on uh, Internet Explorer on a Windows device, 1024. That was kind of what, what things were like back in 2008. Um, but they found that that actually dropped. Um, it went from being 93.5% of their visits were on Windows to 68.2, obviously eaten into by not only uh, OS X, but also by iOS and Android and so on and so forth. Um, and as you would expect, mobile increased dramatically from 0.4% in 2000 or 0.2% in 2008 to 14.4%, um, and it grew like 200 to 400% a year. And browsers went from being dominantly IE to being pretty well dispersed between IE, Firefox, Safari, and Chrome. Um, and 
yeah, Chrome really didn't have have much at the time, or or actually, I don't think Chrome existed. Yeah, Chrome didn't exist at the time in 2008 originally when they were doing stuff. But this was the kicker to me. So in the second quarter of 2008, they detected 71 different screen resolutions, which is a that's a lot of screen resolutions, right? Um, and the, in the first quarter of 2014, because he updated these stats in 2014, um, 1,062. 1,062 different screen sizes. Just screen sizes, right? This is why responsive design is so important as a visual design approach, because you could not design 1,062 different comps, right? That would be <laughs> insane. Um, somebody might try, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, it, kind of making it a little bit, you know, there's a long tail, right? Making it a little bit uh, more manageable of a number. 27 different screen resolutions showed up with more than 10 visits per month uh, in 2008. A little bit more manageable, but in 2014, that was still 200. Even 200 is, is more screen sizes than you want to have to deal with, right? Um, so the, you know, the space that we're looking at right now is much more diverse in terms of screen sizes, in terms of the devices that are accessing our content. We've got everything from your traditional desktops, laptops, and uh, large screen wall displays like this one, uh, to various tablets, e-readers. Um, a lot of people don't realize it, but even the Kindle 3 had a browser in it, and it was a WebKit-based browser. It was e-ink, but it could do things like animations and transitions. So it was fairly capable, um, but it did animations in like painting it with e-ink. <laughs> so it was kind of interesting. It was like old school animation. Um, but all the way down to feature phones and gaming gaming systems like the, the PlayStation Vita or the PSP or even the, the DS um, all had browsers. There's an Opera version for the Nintendo DS. There's an Opera version for, um, for Wii. Um, but even though you know, we kind of know that this is what we're dealing with, right? This tends to be the bubble that we all live in. Right? Most of the people who work in technology, who work on the web, who build websites, um, who manage the building of websites, et cetera, we're all surrounded by these very high-end, shiny black squares, right? Whether they're iOS devices or Android devices or what have you, um, they tend to be the nicer, more expensive, things with higher, like better, better processors and, and so on and so forth. And so it, it kind of gives us a myopic view of what the mobile web is like for a lot of other people. Um, the reality is a bit more messy. You know, there, there are a lot of other devices that are capable of accessing the web, um, some of which look very odd. Um, some of my favorite ones are like the Engage, if anybody remembers that from uh, from Nokia, uh, that was a particularly awesome one. There's another one in here. Let's see if I can find it. This guy's got a rotating screen that was pretty awesome. Um, there's a Nokia device that actually had the numbers run down the sides of the screen. That was pretty cool. Um, but of course, you've got your Blackberries. You've got some of your older Nokia devices that are mo more WAP focused. Um, so there's, there's a lot of variability out there. Um, and especially if you start to pay attention to phones that are used on pay-as-you-go programs, things that, that you would get from TrackPhone or from Boost Mobile or something like that, those devices tend to look very different from the devices that we have in our pockets. Um, and we see stats like smartphones have reached 75% penetration in the US, but the reality is that's concentrated in about 61% of households. Um, and if we actually break things down by income bracket, um, so here we have the smartphone penetration numbers released in uh, March 2015. This is uh, from Pew's research. Um, you had a 50% penetration in the 30,000 and under uh, census tract. And then it obviously goes up a little bit. Not Surprisingly, not all that much between uh, 30,000 to 50,000 and 50,000 to 75,000. But then as you'd expect in the 75,000 and over, income bracket, a lot more smartphones. Um, and this being the average income in the US, which a lot of you guys are probably very familiar with, but a lot of people outside of the government probably aren't really thinking about all that often, right? I had a conversation with a retailer where um, they were talking about, or, or I was asking them what devices they were testing on, and they're like, oh, we, you know, we test on iPhone and we test on iPad. And they're a drugstore chain, fairly major drugstore chain, and I was like, are you testing on any of the tablets that you sell at your drugstores? They're like, we sell tablets? 
the 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 reality is they sell very low end Android tablets that are around fifty dollars, maybe seventy five dollars, and if that's all you have to spend on access to the internet, you would expect that you know they should have a, a good web experience, but that's not always the case. And and in their case, they weren't even testing their site on a device that they were selling. And certainly as a consumer, if I walked in there and I bought that tablet, I would expect that that company's site would actually work on the device that I bought there, but they weren't even testing it. Um, if we start to, to look at um, actually how the, the population breaks down through these different tracks, um, looking at the census data, you see that there's a huge opportunity in the non-smartphone world. So reaching out to people who are on more, more feature phones and the like. Um, and obviously things that are not smartphones. This actually was one of the stats that kind of blew my mind in the Pew research. Um, and that's that smartphone users making less than 30K a year experienced app errors 52% of the time. So they've been able to download an app, but it won't run on their device 52% of the time. So why is that, right? Start to, start to wonder, like they, they have a smartphone, They've downloaded the app. Well, the thing is, a smartphone's not a smartphone necessarily. Like they're not all created equal. So here we have the Galaxy S5, which I realize is, is one gen out of date now, but it still has pretty impressive specs. You've got a 5.1 inch screen uh, at 1920 by 1080. We've got two gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of storage. Um, it's running a 2.5 gigahertz quad core processor. And Android, uh, this was 4.4 when, when I took this uh, slide. Um, it was an $800 phone. Okay. Here we have the CloudFX. This is a Firefox OS phone aimed at the Indian market, but it's still a smartphone. And it's got specs like you know 2007 smartphone specs. Um, you've got a 3.5 inch 480 by 320 screen. You've got 128 megs of RAM. You've got a one gigahertz single core processor and it's running Firefox OS, but it's $35. Okay. Of course, that's aimed at India. So let's look at something a little bit closer to home. Um, here we have the Blue Dash Junior K, um, which also has a 3.5 inch screen uh, at 480 by 320. It's got 256 megs of RAM and a 1.3 gigahertz dual core processor. It also runs Android 4.4. So here we have two devices that look, ostensibly, from an OS standpoint, identical, but vastly different amounts of RAM, vastly different amounts of processing speed. Um, and my guess is that this is the reason that in the $30,000 and under income bracket, people are experiencing app errors 52% of the time, because they don't have this device. They have something more akin to this device. And when you start to look at things, like if you're walking around Target and you go to the track phone area, I, I mean, it, you can literally pick up three or four devices for about 50 bucks. Like, especially if they're having a sale. I ended up getting a, a, a smartphone track phone that had Wi Fi um, that's running the Obigo browser for like $19 or something like that. Um, so it's kind of fun to pick those up and, and be able to actually test on those. You don't even need to have a track phone account because it's Wi Fi enabled, which is cool. Um, but getting those and actually testing on those and seeing what the experience is like is incredibly helpful um, for when you're, you're trying to understand how you can reach people on those devices and ensuring that what you're creating is not going to be too much uh, for them to be able to handle. Um, it's also worth noting that as of Q4 2014, 62% of non-phone connections uh, to the web were actually in cars. So we're starting to see the, the web go into other places as well. And so you know, we, we don't know what the future is going to look like in terms of having browsers on our wrist. We don't have an official first party browser in the Apple Watch yet, but there are a couple options available for Android, um, including Opera Mini. Um, Opera Mini doesn't get a lot of love here in the US, but it's actually the most used mobile browser globally. So it's something to, to consider. I mean, I know most of your target audience is domestic, but there are some, uh, some agencies that do have to do international outreach and such. Um, this is one of my favorites from our device lab. This is the Sylvania netbook. Um, this was a seven inch piece of plastic that ran my favorite operating system, Windows CE. Um, and you could use it 
to go to Facebook and YouTube. I don't know if they still work on the device. I've not tried to go to those two, but it's um, it's pretty awful. But if all again, all if all you have to spend to get on the internet is fifty dollars, like this may be your best bet, even though it's made by people who brought you light bulbs. Yeah. The reality is that there are a lot of different devices out there. There are a lot of different ways of accessing the web. Um, and when you start to look at pictures like this, you can start to feel a little overwhelmed, like Brad in this photo. Um, and you may start you know, praying to higher power, whatever your higher power is. My hope is that as we kind of continue through this talk, that I can get you to the point where you're actually starting to, to feel good about all of this variability and the opportunities that are created by having all of these different devices. You actually start to embrace all this stuff because the future is kind of a, a big nebulous thing. We don't know where the world is going um, as we start to get more internet connected cars that not only have the ability to redistribute Wi-Fi within their car to people who have their own tablets and such, but I mean the Tesla is a, a giant connected car with a big I think it's like a nine inch tablet, right, in the dash, um, which is kind of crazy. I haven't gotten them to donate one to our device lab yet, but I've been asking um, <laughs> one day. Um, but of course we have watches, we have gaming systems, we have the, the internet fridge, you know, that'll, that you'll be able to, uh, to, I don't know, browse to your grocery store's website and order stuff. Um, but then what's not even in this picture are things like the Echo and you know, all of these uh, voice-enabled assistants like Cortana and Google Now and Siri, which currently can't really browse the web. They can access some APIs that let them get access to web content, which isn't quite the same, but it's probably not going to be too much longer before they get connected to text-to-speech and screen reader technology. And then all of a sudden, you will be able to have, you know, Cortana read you a particular web page or Siri read to you from your readability list or something like that. So that's another thing that we need to think about. So we don't know what the future holds. Now, when I think about our jobs as web designers and, and as people creating experiences for the web, I actually think there are a lot of similarities with people who work in food service um, who are, are bussing your table. Now, whether you, you drink water or, or gin, um, the uh, the, the th same thing holds that when, when you walk through the door of a particular restaurant or, or bar or what have you, the, the person who's serving you doesn't know how much of that particular beverage you're going to consume, how thirsty you are, what have you. Um, they can only react to what you're doing and, and what your needs are and try and cater to those as best possible. Um, and in the same way, when people come to our websites, we don't really know a whole lot about their situation. There's information that we can sort of glean from their user agent strings. Of course, those can be spoofed, so that, that's not necessarily reliable. Um, we could maybe run some profiling on them to try and figure out what sort of data connection they're on and stuff like that, but that can, con sign, yeah, that can sometimes penalize the user because it's having to download additional data, which they may be paying by the bit for. Um, but we don't know. All we can do is kind of rise to meet their needs. Now, when I was in Seattle a number of years ago, um, I went out to, to two very nice restaurants two nights in a row. And in one of them, I had a very good experience. And in another one, I had an amazing experience. And I couldn't quite figure out what the difference between them were because in both restaurants, the food was very good. It was beautifully presented, beautifully plated. They had a really nice ambience. And the, uh, the service was friendly. And what I realized later, the water service was really the, the big differentiator between these two uh, restaurant experiences. And in one restaurant, I, I remember my glass would you know, dip to about half, or maybe I would get it all the way to the, the bottom, um, and nobody would come by to refill it. And you, you know that frustration you feel when the person's not coming by, and then like, you actually take your glass and you set it out on the edge of the table and you're like, look at this friggin' glass and come by and fill it. Um, I didn't have that frustrating of an experience, but I had, you know, I, there were a couple of times where I was out of water and that was not very pleasant. Whereas in the other restaurant, I remember I was talking and I, I tend to drink a lot of water and I was having a conversation with my wife and I took a big long drink of water, probably drained at least half the glass, um, went back to talking to my wife, reached for my glass again to take another drink and it was full. And I never saw anybody come by. And that was magic. And to me, 
Those are the sorts of magical experiences that we should be striving to create for people on the web. We should not be making them feel like we're making special considerations for them and for their device and for their needs and their network. We should just be doing that transparently and they should just be getting a good experience regardless. Um, because the reality is that we don't know. And a lot of times when we think we know things, we know a lot less than, than we think we do. So for instance, I run into a lot of companies that are like, oh, you know, we, we don't have to worry about the no JavaScript scenario because we don't have any no JavaScript users. And I was like, how do you know you have no JavaScript users or no no JavaScript users? Um, and they say, well, that's what our Google Analytics tell us. Well, how are you tracking your Google Analytics? Are you using the default mechanism? Because that's JavaScript based. So if you don't have JavaScript, you're not getting any record of those people. And then they're like, oh. Or alternately, we don't have any of X browser or, or our X browser percentage is super low. Um, and I'm like, well, you know, what's the experience like in that browser? Oh, it's crappy. Well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, potentially. We had a thing in um, a list apart when, this is to, to give you a little bit of framing, Netscape for seven days, uh, for those of you who've been on the web for a while. Um, I'm old. Um, the, uh, we stopped serving uh, CSS to Netscape Navigator 4.7. Um, and, we, and we did this by assigning a, a media type and, and that there was, there was a way basically to filter out the CSS from, from being delivered to Netscape 4.7. And much to our surprise, the number of people visiting on Netscape 4.7 actually went up. So all of a sudden, we gave them a degraded experience, for sure. You know, no styles whatsoever. We weren't even, even catering to them at all. And they had a better experience and, and started coming back more. So that was kind of crazy. Um, so how do we cope with all of this crazy variability? Um, I, got, I got to work a lot with Molly Holschlag, who is a, another web standards advocate um, very early on. Um, and she kind of passed on to me this, this wisdom of trying to be a, um, an inattentive Zen master, basically. Trying, basically trying to control everything that you can up until the point you realize that you have to relinquish control. And I think a lot of people who come to the web now who are either coming over from maybe from traditional software development or coming over from back-end development and, and are making their way to the front, of the front end of the web haven't quite grasped the way the web works, the way we distribute stuff over the web and all of the different things that can affect our ability to get content to a consumer. Um, so the fact that we don't control the network, you know, a, a Comcast Xfinity router can inject content into your page Right? We don't control you know, whether somebody maintains their network connection as they're moving along in a train or in a car or what have you, um, or hotel Wi-Fi or, or whatever it is that they happen to be dealing with. Um, we don't control the browser, obviously, that they're using to access the web. We don't control what plugins they have installed in those browsers that might be manipulating the document. Um, there are so many things that are beyond our control. So we can only control up until a point and then we kind of have to let go. And it's a really important lesson. Um, and this is really where progressive enhancement as a concept shines, because it, it really is about creating opportunities for somebody's experience to be better, but always assuring that there is an experience. It's basically building the web without placing any specific technological restrictions on it. So no, no specific technology. All we're assuming is that you have HTTP, because otherwise you're just not getting the web at all, right? So you've got that. We can make that assumption. And in some way, you have access to text. For some people, that may be actual reading text, or it may be listening to a screen reader read that text to them. That's the only thing that we can assume. But then we look for opportunities to enhance that experience based on the browser capabilities, based on the device capabilities, based on network bandwidth, whatever it is, we look for opportunities to enhance that experience, to create that more engaging user experience, to remove some of the friction from whatever it is that they're trying to do. And we do that by taking a layered approach 
to building up a website. So starting with the content that we know is going to be available to them. And then adding on top of that semantics that then Im imbue more meaning to our documents. And then adding design into it to create visual hierarchy um, to guide somebody's eye through the page. And then adding greater interactivity to the page in order to you know, streamline certain processes in order to not have to go back to the server uh, every time somebody submits a form or in order to check out a username or, or what have you. Um, and then integrated throughout all of these layers and a little bit on top, we have accessibility that we want to add into this. You know, when we're talking about accessibility at the baseline, we want to make sure that, that we're writing clear, well-written prose. When we're talking about it from the semantic layer, we're talking about making sure that we're actually using elements that help rather than hurt. So we're, we're using things that are actually usable, like buttons and inputs rather than like divs for everything. Um, from the design level, we want to make sure, obviously, we always have a good level of contrast, that the font sizes are large enough that somebody can read them, or at least are scalable so that somebody can bump up the font size if they want to. Interactivity, we want to make sure that we're not hiding things in inappropriate ways that don't make them available to assistive technology. Um, and then we can actually use, uh, if I switch over to, to the different technologies that these layers are built on, in ARIA, which is the Accessible Rich Internet Application spec, we can actually enhance our documents further and uh, explain what complicated interfaces actually are to people who are using assistive technology. And I'll show an example of that kind of towards the end of this talk. Um, so at the very baseline, as I said, we've got text and HTTP. HTML is our language for marking up our documents, for adding semantics, CSS for design, obviously, and JavaScript for interaction. And each of these layer uh, one upon the other to create a better experience. Now, these layers themselves, are it's not like you have HTML or you don't. right? There are many layers within each of these building blocks of the experience. So you might have a user that only has HTML4, or maybe they only have HTML2, depending on the browser that they're using. Right? You may have some that have HTML5 support. You may have some that have HTML5. They've got HTML4, obviously. And they also have microformat support through an add-on that they have or some, something that's built into the browser to expose microformatted data, or RDFA, or um, microdata. So each of these is broken into sublayers. And when we build with progressive enhancement, whatever the user can take advantage of, they will. So they get sort of a customized a la carte experience that's tailored to them and to their, their browser and their device's capabilities. And the reason that we're able to do this is because browsers ignore what they don't understand. So this is what allows us to use CSS3, and IE6 doesn't throw a fit if it happens to view the page. Right? It's what allows us to use an HTML5 element, and if somebody happens to be using links or a screen reader or something like that, it doesn't cause any issues. Uh, so Christian Heilman, my, my colleague in Microsoft, uh, formerly of Mozilla, um, pulled up this great Mitch Hedberg quote. I love an escalator because an escalator can never break. It can only become stairs. Um, he goes on to talk about if, if you can put a sign up if it breaks. We apologize for the convenience. But, um, <laughs> but this, is, this is essentially how we want to be building websites, right? We want to build websites that never break, that are robust. The, Chrysler, the 1964 Chrysler Imperial of websites. If anybody's a Demolition Derby fan, that, that car was actually banned from the Demolition Derby because it's indestructible. Right. Or if you're more of a DOD person, the A-10 tank killer, maybe, I don't know. Um, so in the very early days of the web, uh, things were changing very, very rapidly. Um, we went very quickly from having just plain text to all of a sudden being able to design our documents a little bit, and everybody put their marble backgrounds on and their big gold uh, lettering in Times New Roman and all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, but then we all of a sudden were able to do audio and video and Shockwave and Java plugins that made our uh, sites reflect like they were in a pool of water and all kinds of BS like that. Um, and it was really hard to keep up. There was so much that was changing, and it was changing so rapidly that we adopted this idea of graceful degradation as an approach to web design 
where we would focus on modern browsers that had the plugins that we, we decided were needed for the web, like Flash. And then at the, the very tail end of the development process, we might look at older browsers or browsers that didn't have the particular plugin. But in most cases, we relegated that so far down the priority list that we rarely had budget to cover them. So we would use things like user agent sniffing to outright block that particular browser, right? Who cares, right? But uh, kind of the, the dark side of that, using user agent sniffing, is if you, if you assume that any browser that you don't recognize is not a browser that can access your content, then you end up with situations like when I went to a banking site and tried to log in, and it said, I'm sorry, you must have Netscape Navigator 6 uh, or better, or IE6 or better. And I was like, I'm on Chrome 32,486. <laughs> right? You end up with these, these bad situations. Um, now, the approach of graceful degradation um, is pretty similar to progressive enhancement, uh, but slightly different. Um, but, but what it ultimately ends up being like, if you kind of follow the Mitch Hedberg quote a little bit further, is it's essentially building a lift or an elevator and then having to add stairs when the lift breaks. So if all of a sudden you found out that that carefully crafted JavaScript framework-based website no longer was functioning for some reason, maybe it requires too much RAM and some devices just can't load it, they just shut down, the browser crashes because they don't have enough memory to run the site, um, now you have to figure out something else. So anecdotally, uh, Google Maps, when that was initially launched in 2005, was built JavaScript only. And it wasn't built, built with accessibility in mind. Um, and a friend of a friend that worked on the project um, basically confided in her that when they went back to make it accessible and to, to make it work without JavaScript, um, it took about twice as long as it would have taken had they actually integrated that from the beginning. Um, and we've actually found that following progressive enhancement um, is actually far cheaper overall um, than to, to follow the graceful degradation approach. We built one site that was a, um, a Chrome app. It was, in, it was a web-based Chrome app uh, right when the Chrome Web Store was coming out. And we designed it only for Chrome. We were testing it in Safari as well because Chrome didn't have certain features like 3D uh, transforms and stuff like that that Safari had. And the Google Chrome team was like, we'll have this by the time the app launches, so it'll be OK. Uh, just use Safari as a reference. So the site worked in Safari, and it worked in Chrome. But it didn't work in anything else. And it was using all cutting edge technologies like Web SQL and, and um, you know, transforms, transitions, uh, all sorts of other craziness, uh, offline caching, um, and the like. And so we, uh, we went through that process and built it for those platforms. And let's say that cost x dollars, right? Um, they came back to us about nine months later and said, we'd really like to roll this out to Firefox and to Internet Explorer. And it was Internet Explorer 9 at the time. Internet Explorer 9 didn't support um, uh, transitions at the time. Um, 10 and such does now. But um, so we knew the animation stuff. We weren't going to try and mimic that in JavaScript because that seemed silly. But the, the major problem that we ran into was that um, Web SQL had been abandoned at the W3C. And it had been abandoned mainly because um, Internet Explorer and, or, or, or Microsoft, rather, and Mozilla had pushed back on it and had said that they were never going to implement that technology. So even though it existed in Chrome and Safari and Opera, it was never going to go out elsewhere on the web. And in fact, as a standard, it was going to be abandoned. So we needed to figure out something else. The alternative spec that was proposed was IndexedDB, which is another JavaScript-based um, database, data store, uh, client-side data store. But the problem was that it was still in the development stage, and no browser had an implementation of that yet. So we needed to do client-side data storage, but we couldn't really figure out a, a, an easy way to do that. So I ended up taking local storage, which is another um, local caching mechanism that we have available to us, and writing a SQL wrapper around it so I could use basically the same logic that I had used to, uh, to do the web SQL stuff, but use the local storage data store. So that enabled us to go out to these two other browsers. And that we had given, a, given them a budget about 40% of the original project to make it work for these two additional browsers. It ended up going a little bit over that. Okay. So that was a project following the graceful degradation um, strategy because 
the client basically said, we're only targeting this browser, so don't do progressive enhancement. Now contrast that with another project that we did, uh, which was for a major investment company here in the States. And they came to us because they were experiencing some issues with their apps. Um, they had login, obviously, for their application so that you could look at your, how your investments were doing and stuff like that. Um, as a large investment company, security is kind of important. Um, so they wanted to be able to quickly roll out new security features and stuff like that for login, um, like challenge questions and, and those sorts of things. Um, and they wanted to be able to do that more easily than they could in the app ecosystem, which they would have to update the web service, and then they would have to update each and every one of the apps to consume that web service. And they had separate iPhone and iPad apps, and then they had an Android app, and they were considering a Windows Phone app. So every time they rolled out a security upgrade, they'd have to update the web service, they'd have to update the app, including updating the UI, adding new screens, making it consume the web service, all that sort of stuff then push it out to the, to the app store, hope it gets through the approval process, and then cross their fingers that users actually downloaded it. Right? So that's a, a potentially two, three week process easily to get that, get that new security feature rolled out. So they approached us to do it from a web standpoint. So they would open up a web view within the app, take you through the authentication process, and then basically have a handshake from the website back to the application to tell it that it was authenticated. Um, so we did that, and we were only targeting uh, those four platforms, basically. So iPhone, iPad, since they were treating them separately. Um, Android, generically, this um, tablet version. And then the potential Windows device. Um, so we did that. And let's say that one cost Y. Um, and then we delivered along with that. We, we built it all with progressive enhancement. We delivered a pattern library to them and instructions as to how to build out the remaining screens they needed. We built out like 35. They had an additional 100 screens they needed to build. Um, and then it came back to us about six months later, and they were like, this is great. It's working really well for the applications. We'd like to put this on our MDOT site now. And then they handed us an Excel spreadsheet of 1,400 different user agent strings that access login in two days. Um, so I wrote a script that parsed all of that data and basically um, got me back basic specs. So operating system, operating system version, browser, browser version, uh, device that it was on, all of that sort of stuff so that I could begin to aggregate that because there was no way we were going to be able to test 1,400 different devices. Um, so doing some aggregation based on, on similar specs, I was able to get that down to about 23 devices that represented 97% of that spectrum. Um, and we told them, like, we're pretty confident that that other 3%, if we test on all of these devices, will be captured. But if, if something comes up in that 3% that we didn't get, you know, we'll get that device specifically and test on it and fix it. Um, and then we gave them a budget of one third of the original project. So one third of four <laughs> to make four. We came in at half that. And we were dealing with OpenWave. We were dealing with BlackBerry 4. We were dealing with BlackBerry 5. We were dealing with some really heinous mobile devices. And we were able to do all of that in one sixth the time and budget that it took us to do four initially. That's the power of progressive enhancement. It's amazing. And yet, you know, when, when we build sites, we often don't build them with progressive enhancement. You know, if, if we follow Mitch Hedberg's advice, you know, if a, a dynamic web page should never break, it should just become a web page, right? But Lifehacker, for instance, when they launched their platform back in 2010, um, they this is for the entire Gawker media platform. So it was Gawker, it was Lifehacker, it was Gizmodo, I think. Um, and there was an error in their code, and it caused all of the JavaScript execution to stop. And since all of it was being loaded in via Ajax, this is what all of their users saw on every one of their properties. And that was just from one error in the JavaScript. But of course, none of us that write JavaScript ever have buggy code get out into the public, right? Never happens. Um, so surely that, that won't happen to us. I love that in the redesign a little bit later, they've, they've since redesigned and it works for that JavaScript now, but in the redesign a little bit later, they had a little loading GIF that just sat there and spun. But if you didn't have JavaScript, nothing was ever loading. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of silly. Um, that would be effectively like throwing water in the face of our customers. But um, like I love JavaScript. I write JavaScript all the time. But I also recognize that, that JavaScript is a program that you're writing. 
and it's being it has to be executed. And if there's any issues in that execution, it's going to fall apart. It's going to stop executing. Um, so bugs are one way that that, that can can fall apart. Um, browser add-ons can also cr create a um, hostile environment, shall we say, for your JavaScript in the page. They might inject an element where you expected another element to be, or they may remove an element that you were expecting to be there, or the browser add-on may have an error of its own that then causes everything to stop working. Um, Overzealous firewalls, you guys may deal with this a little bit internally within the, the government. I'm sure there are some firewalls that probably block JavaScript outright. I know when I was doing some work for IBM uh, back in the, the day, uh, they were actually blocking JavaScript at the firewall entirely. Um, I'll actually talk about another example of that uh, more recently and in a little bit larger scale. Um, underpowered devices, so if you've got a device that just cannot load, doesn't have enough RAM to, to actually load in and execute all of the JavaScript. That's going to stop it from executing. Um, and then there's the page is still loading scenario. So while the page is waiting for all of your assets to be downloaded, um, JavaScript is not going to be running. Right? You might be able to, once, once the DOM has loaded, you might have some stuff that you can execute. But while it's waiting for all of your JavaScript to download, none of that JavaScript is being run. So here's a, a brief example. This was actually the Obama for America site trying to be loaded on an old BlackBerry. The BlackBerry ran out of RAM. So that was kind of bad. Um, so yeah, Sky in the UK, one of the, the biggest provi broadband providers in the UK, blocked jQuery from the jQuery CDN as malware and basically took down any site that was dependent on jQuery um, for loading content and stuff like that that was using the jQuery CDN version. So that was kind of bad. Um, hotels constantly manipulate content that, that flows through their networks, um, and in some cases make their Wi-Fi even more terrible, and then block you from being able to use other people's Wi-Fi. Um, but uh, you know, hotels are, are a, great ex a great whipping boy for this, but Comcast, if you, if you join one of Comcast's Xfinity, like if you're a subscriber and you, then you use somebody else's Wi-Fi, uh, Comcast Xfinity Wi-Fi router, um, you get ads injected into your content. Um, so unless you're running all of your sites under HTTPS, you can have effectively man-in-the-middle attacks from routers, which is awesome, or hotels, or airports. That's another, another one. Uh, Atlanta's airport does that. So anyway, JavaScript is the biggest potential single point of failure for any website. And I think a lot of people kind of overlook that. They think that, um, that we basically have a VM in the browser now because JavaScript is so powerful. And it is, and you can do some awesome stuff with it, but you don't control that execution environment in the same way that you control the execution environment when you're writing server-side programming. Right. Um, so I mentioned that graceful degradation and progressive enhancement are, can look fairly similar. And the reason is that progressive enhancement is just a specialized form of graceful degradation. Anything that you build that is progressively enhanced will naturally degrade gracefully in, in older browsers or browsers that can't do what you need them to do. Okay. Um, and the overall idea of progressive enhancement is that you begin with the content, the core tasks, whatever it is that a user needs to accomplish, and then build up the experience from there. Another analogy I like to use for people who aren't particularly technical is the continuum from a peanut to a peanut M&M. I really like peanut <laughs> M&Ms. So, you start with the peanut, this rich nugget of content that's a perfectly good snack, assuming you don't have a peanut allergy. Um, but when you coat it in chocolate, it becomes even better. right? And then you put that candy shell on it, and it's friggin' amazing. Um, but any of these is a valid snack option. But I don't think anybody would argue that the peanut M&M is a vast improvement over the peanut. So this is the way that I think that we should be designing sites to enhance layer by layer to improve the overall experience. And ultimately, what it's about is we never want to put our users in a situation where we're saying you must be this high to ride. Nobody wants to be that short kid who doesn't get to ride the tilt-a-whirl, right? Nobody likes being made to feel that way. And yet, you know, we've we've got a history of doing that. You know, you need to be using this in Netscape Navigator four, or you know, this site looks best in X, or you should be using Chrome or what have you. Now. Um, Responsive web design and mobile first as kind of concepts within the, the web design world, when you put those two together, 
that is kind of the happy place that progressive enhancement lives in. When you approach responsive design from a mobile first standpoint, it's very respectful of your users because you can load in a baseline experience that's completely linear that works for somebody on an older feature phone or something like that, and then enhance that using media queries as you've got more screen real estate. And that single linear view is perfectly acceptable for somebody in IE6, IE7, IE8, browsers that don't understand media queries at all. Like we can give them that experience. And as long as they can do what they need to do, they're good. All right, so I'm gonna walk you guys through a couple of different interface components and how you can approach progressively enhancing those and how you can actually think about and plan for how those can be evolved for different users. Um, so I'm gonna start with a simple example. Here we have, a, a, we're gonna look at a light box. So we have an image here on the left-hand side that when you click on it would then open up in a light box. So on a large screen, this makes a lot of sense, right? You can have a, a light box open up and, and it probably doesn't take over the whole screen, um, but you can view something larger. <clears throat> Excuse me. On a smaller screen, it may not make much sense to actually have that enlarged because I'm, I'm sure most of you have, ha have had the experience where you click on something and it comes up in a light box on your phone and it's the same size or smaller than it was on the screen. Or my favorite, is it comes up, but it's slightly off the screen, so you like pinch, and then it runs across the screen, and you're trying to chase it by pinching and zooming, and it's just really frustrating. Um, so there are some scenarios where having a light box, you know, not necessarily enhancing the experience, right? So let's explore that a little bit. If we start with page load, right? This is what I call um, interface experience maps. Um, and if we start with page load, we then get to the first decision point, which is do we have JavaScript available to us or not? Okay. If we don't have JavaScript available for us, most light boxes on the web require JavaScript, so we're not going to have a light box. That's going to be our default resting state of this interface, is no light box option. So that would look something like this, which is fine. But if we have JavaScript, we could verify whether the browser is wide enough to actually have the light box make sense. So let's say if, if you're working in an organization that actually has some standards around how big the big images are, you probably know how wide they are. So you could test to make sure that they're at least that wide, or maybe they're at least twice as wide as they're being displayed on, uh, on the page in the thumbnail version. So if we verify the browser width condition, if there's not enough width, we don't do anything, right? But if there is enough width, so that would be what that would look like, but if there is enough width, we can go ahead and create that link using JavaScript and then make the image clickable and then you know, have any of the lightbox code that we actually need in order to, to create that lightbox. And we can make that browser width condition actually be a live test. We can test for when the browser uh, is resized or rotated or what have you um, in order to deliver the most appropriate experience to our users. So from a markup standpoint, for those of you that are code people, um, the way that we approach this um, on a couple of sites was to do something like having an image, and then we've got our normal source for the thumbnail, and then we added a data attribute to it to point at the large version. And then the JavaScript could come along and pay attention to that and be like, okay, there's an enlargeable version of this, and if the circumstances are right, I can go ahead and add a class of enlargeable to the image, which then gives you the, the finger in the CSS when you uh, mouse over it. And then it injects a paragraph with a class of enlarge and a link to the enlarged version and adds all of the JavaScript event handlers and stuff like that that are necessary in order to actually trigger the, uh, the enlargement. So does that make sense? Fairly simple example. So I find that IX maps are actually a really simple way because they're just flowcharts. Um, to explore different options for us and different opportunities for enhancing a, a given experience. So I'll walk through another example. Um, again, dealing with smaller images, we often have kind of overview pages that have a bunch of images on them, right? Um, now, on a smaller screen, these can present problems with reading. Like if you've ever, if you've ever been to a site and they don't just stack them on top of the content if they happen to float them. Sometimes you end up with those really weird rags on the right-hand side where you get like one word and then there's like three inches of white space going down the image and then the next word's on the, the next line after. It's not a good reading experience, right? 
Now, that could be solved by simply making the image display block and not floated. But there's also the other potential issue, which is that's a lot of extra stuff to download. Each of those images needs to be downloaded separately, um, at least until we get HTTP2. Then it'll be just streamed in, right? Um, but still, that's a lot of extra content to be downloaded. And perhaps on a, a smaller screen on a mobile network, that may not be all that useful. So one approach to making this more readable um, you know, that, that people have used in responsive design is actually to use display none on the image. Um, but depending on how you do that, the images might still be downloaded even though they're not shown. So that's generally not a, a recommended approach. Um, so let's say we wanted to have this experience where on a wider screen, we want to have the guy yelling. Um, but on a smaller screen, we don't want to have that image in there. Okay. So coming back to the IX map, we start with our page load. And if we don't have JavaScript available, we don't want to have the image in there. So again, a solid, a solid baseline that is trying to make the, the best decision for the user, just saying like the content is still usable, and this will be our, our decent baseline. The other thing that, that's kind of good about this approach, especially in a small screen scenario, is that the images aren't really as necessary on a small screen as they are on a large screen. If you look at, say, the NewYorkTimes.com um, homepage, there's a lot of content on there. It's very visually dense. And so the images are helpful for drawing your eye to particular articles, just because there's so much competition. On a small screen, you don't have that sort of competition. You're not dealing with the same amount of density. Um, so again, another reason you may not need them. So even on a widescreen, this is a perfectly valid experience. There's nothing wrong with this. We've got decent typography. We've got decent spacing, all that sort of stuff. But if we do have enough room, or, or rather, if we do have JavaScript, we can verify, again, the browser width. We want to make sure maybe that the, the width of the screen is at least twice as wide as the thumbnail, so we don't, don't end up with weird wrapping if it's loaded. Um, if, there's, if that condition isn't met, we don't load the image, so we end up with this. That's perfectly fine. Um, but if we do meet the browser width condition, we can adjust the markup and add some custom CSS and load that into the page. So lazy loading the images, and this is what we end up with. Now, from uh, and, and that gets obviously repeated across all of the, uh, the images on the page. So from a markup standpoint, um, the way that we approached doing this for, for our clients was to have some sort of element, whether it's a paragraph or a div or whatever, some sort of block level element, um, that we would have a data hyphen image hyphen source on. So that would indicate to JavaScript in, de in a declarative way, if the opportunity is there, load this image. Okay. Um, and then when the JavaScript ran, it would go through and it would add a data has image equals true attribute to the, uh, the container. And it would lazy load in that image element by injecting the image tag, which JavaScript is great at doing mundane and stupid things like this, right? Uh, stupidly simple. Now, on the CSS end of things, to make sure that paragraph or that div or whatever doesn't show, we could use data hyphen image hyphen source using an attribute selector and set display none on that. So it's just a paragraph. It's not a lot of extra markup. It's not going to cause any issues, even if CSS isn't available. Um, but then when we've got that data image loaded attribute added in there via JavaScript, then we would want to display a block. So now all of a sudden, once that image has been loaded, JavaScript basically flips a switch and the image appears. Okay. On the JavaScript end of things, and don't worry if you're not a JavaScript person, I'll walk through kind of how this works. We've got a resize function here that watches for the browser resizing. Um, and basically, you pass a function into it, a callback. Um, and that function runs once when the page is loaded, just so you get that initial baseline. You don't have to like wait for somebody to resize. Um, and then it, does, it has some throttling in here so that as somebody is dragging their window larger or, or, uh, larger or smaller, um, the, the resize event is constantly firing, and we don't want it to fire you know, as they're dragging. We want it to fire when they stop. Um, so that, that's basically what it does here, is it just throttles it so that it only runs once. So you're not constantly executing that code. Using it, um, we could create a browser width variable, and then watch resize and assign the width of the browser to that browser width variable. And then within our JavaScript for lazy loading, we could reference that browser width and test it against a threshold that we've set uh, for how wide we want the browser to be in order to load those images. Okay, so just a, a simple way of approaching that. Now, 
if we wanted to make this a live condition, so let's say somebody happens to be on a seven inch tablet. Like a seven inch Android tablet tends to be very wide in landscape mode and narrow in uh, portrait mode, right? So maybe the images don't make sense in that scenario when they go to portrait mode, but they've already been in landscape mode. So how do we deal with that? We've already loaded the image in. It probably doesn't make sense to remove that markup because that's a lot of extra JavaScript. Well, what if we got a little bit smarter about the CSS? Rather than having data image source, data image loaded just in the, the base styles, if we put that inside of a media query with our threshold as the min width, now all of a sudden if somebody goes from landscape view to portrait, those images just disappear. So just having a little bit smarter CSS so that we don't have to make JavaScript work quite as hard when somebody switches back from the image loading to the narrow screen, so we're presenting the best possible reading experience for them. That one makes sense? All right, any questions so far? Anyone think I'm full of crap? No? All right, that's good. All those people are on the, uh, the live stream. <laughs> I can't see them raising their hands. All right, through two more demos. Um, so this one is actually a demo that Brad Frost created for a, a piece he did. Um, and uh, talking about being future friendly. And so this is the future friendly t-shirt store. Um, and on a wider screen, you've got this larger picture and you've got your thumbnails and stuff like that. But the interesting thing that I want to talk about is actually down here at the bottom. So on the small screen, you have this similar t-shirts and eight reviews um, block. And so this content on a wider screen actually has uh, similar t-shirts with thumbnails and then the reviews actually exposed. Okay. Um, now you might think, hey, I could use display none just to hide that content on a smaller screen and then make it display on a larger screen. But again, you're going to be basically putting a tax on your users who have smaller screens because you're forcing them to download all of that content um, that they're not getting access to. Um, so the way that Brad approached this is without JavaScript, those are simply links to the reviews and to the related t-shirts on separate pages. Okay, um, but so that's what oops, that's what you end up with. All right, let's do it again. There we go. So you just end up with this little small widget with a little plus next to it. So that's the no JavaScript experience, even on a large screen. And then if JavaScript's available, it checks to see how wide the screen is. Um, if there's not enough width, it holds for user actions. This is a slightly different twist on what we've been doing. It's going to wait. If there is enough screen resolution it's going to go ahead and lazy load the reviews and lazy load the related t-shirts into the page. So you end up with something that looks like that. Now, on the hold for user action bit, on a smaller screen, if somebody taps the reviews, it then lazy loads those reviews into the page so it doesn't have to take them to that other web page. So you end up with that. Okay, from a markup standpoint, he has a section here with a class of auxiliary and reviews, and then an anchor that points to the reviews.html page. Um, and then when it's loaded, he adds a class of loaded on here. He opens up the anchor. Apparently, our screens are going up. Is, is that automatic? Um, automatic here. And then the lazy loaded content comes in in the, uh, the dark orange. Any questions on this one? Does that make a decent amount of sense? All right. Last but not least. We've got the tabbed interface. So this is a common thing that we see on the web. Um, and in order to achieve a tabbed interface from a, a markup standpoint, there's quite a lot of markup that's required for this, right? We need to have a list of links that will enable each of the different tab panels. Um, and then we obviously need the panels of content themselves. So here we have a container that's going to uh, like hold the whole thing. Then we have our list of tabs. Then we've got the individual panels in the, uh, the blue there. So this is kind of the traditional approach, but for somebody who doesn't have JavaScript available, um, they actually might get a tabbed interface that doesn't function, right? If we're, if we're assuming, it may look like a tabbed interface if we load all of our styles in automatically um, and apply them to this markup, but it doesn't actually do anything because we only have hashes in these anchor elements where the tabs are. Right, so that's that's not necessarily a, a good experience, and it's extra markup that they're having to download too that they're not getting any benefit from. 
So it's kind of painful on two points. So a number of years ago, I started looking, you know, are, is there a simpler way to do this that would actually take advantage of progressive enhancement? And so I was able to boil it down to creating, having some sort of container that identifies its content as being potentially turned into a tabbed interface. Okay, so in this case, I'm just showing it as div class tabbed interface. It could be a data attribute, it could be whatever. Um, and then the markup inside of that actually has heading levels. And those heading levels create a not natural document outline, and I can pay attention to that in JavaScript and use that to inform the tabbed interface, to basically use those heading levels as the tab, and then the content because becomes the content of the tab panels. So basically, with no JavaScript and just some basic CSS, I would have a perfectly usable linear experience, um, but then I could turn it into a tabbed interface if the situation is right. So from an IX map standpoint, on load, with no JavaScript, we just have that linear experience. And you, know, you could trade off, have CSS, no CSS, blah, blah, blah. You can go down all sorts of rabbit holes with these. Um, so we get this basic experience. If we do have JavaScript, though, we'll split the content into sections based on those heading levels, and then make the tabs assign any event handlers we need for the keyboard, for the mouse, and so on and so forth, um, in order to make it function as a tab interface. So from a markup standpoint, we go from having the, the div with a class of tabbed interface um, to having the markup that I showed originally. But all of this extra markup is being generated by JavaScript instead of existing from the get-go. The other bonus of this approach is that if you decide later on, hey, we don't like the tabbed interface, we just want to get rid of them across the board, you just drop that JavaScript and it's gone. Right? You don't have to try and rip out all of that inline content. Now, I want to point out, I also have a class of tab interface enabled. So tab interface is the name of the JavaScript object. Um, and then, so I've got tab interface hyphen enabled. And that class has been added to the container. And all of the styles to make this look like a tab interface begin with that class as a prefix. So only the styles that, are, or the styles to make this look like a tab interface are turned on by JavaScript, basically, once it, it knows that it's got everything in place to make it work. Um, I could take this a step further and verify whether there's enough room for a tab interface. Because in some cases, the tab content might be really long. Or in some cases, I might have too many tabs that could fit in, say, a, a mobile screen. Or if I'm doing a site that's in German, there's no way I'm going to be able to do a tab interface. It would not make sense to do so. Um, so I could verify whether there's enough space for the tabs. Maybe I do something like, generate the tab list, apply the styles to it, inject it into the page visibly, test to see whether it overflows the size of the screen, and then ditch it if I can't use the tab interface, um, or create the tab interface from it at that point if I know I can do it. Um, or you may just set a threshold. But doing it based on the live content probably makes the most sense, because then you'll get tab interfaces sometimes and no tab interfaces other times. Um, but if there's not enough room, maybe I want to do an alternative that's similar in its behavior to a tab interface. Maybe I want to make it into an accordion, which would work better in a portrait view, right? And still has the, the ability to collapse that, that content away. Um, but if there is enough room, I can go ahead and make the tab interface. So this is starting to evolve an interface using an IX map, starting to explore different alternatives. Now, taking this a step further, if I drill down into this accordion bit, well, in HTML5, we have native accordions with details and summary. So I could test whether details is supported as an element. And if it's not, I can go ahead and build the accordion and add the JavaScript that's necessary to make it work. But if details and summary is supported, I could just go ahead and adjust the markup to be details and summary. And the browser will automatically do the accordioning that's a word for me, right? So again, these are, are such a low barrier to entry. Like anybody, even you know, people who are not designers, can actually participate in the creation of these different experiences um, and help explore these. And it's really easy to just like erase a portion and add another branch and, and figure out where you're going next with it. Um, and the reason that I really like IX maps like this is that 
they give you a clear indication of what it is that you're trying to build with a particular interface, with a particular module that you're working on, or a particular pattern. Um, and that becomes helpful to the content strategist because they can know if they need to write alternate content for the different forms that are going to be displayed to the user. It's helpful for the designer because they know what, that they can design the different endpoints that a user has to experience. They're helpful for the developer because the developer knows what the decision points are too and can really contribute to that. And you could get really crazy with it. Like if you're doing carousels and stuff like that, like is touch supported, blah, blah, blah. You can go into all of these different uh, alternate paths with it. But most of all, where this is really helpful is for people who are doing QA because they can see what the different expectations are for a given interface and they can know when they should switch into each different one because otherwise they're just kind of like, what am I seeing? Like, yeah, it works on this browser and they don't really understand what the implications are. Um, one of the clients, another investment company that, that we worked with, um, they created their own version of uh, Pattern Lab, Brad Frost Pattern Lab. Um, and what they built into that was an additional toggle that let them turn JavaScript on and off, and it let them turn various levels of CSS on and off. So they actually had a dropdown with five different states. It started with no, C or no CSS, no JavaScript, so they could see the baseline HTML within uh, Pattern Lab. Then they could see baseline CSS, no JavaScript, baseline CSS with JavaScript, CSS3 without JavaScript, and then CSS3 with JavaScript, which was pretty awesome. And so they could actually test all of that and, and basically be able to unit test each individual component within their pattern library, um, which was really powerful for them. Now, I mentioned uh, the Accessible Rich Internet Application Spec, or ARIA. Uh, so I want to walk through um, the tabbed interface and how you can actually use a little bit of ARIA in order to make this uh, more accessible to users. So here we have the overall list, which has a role of tab list. And inside of that, we have roles of tabs. So the way that ARIA operates is that it has these different roles that an element can play within the interface. Um, so this tab has a role of tab. It's currently selected, so ARIA selected is true. And it controls folder hyphen one. The JavaScript um, inserted all of these IDs onto the different tab panels as well as the tabs in order to create the associations between the different elements in order to enable that. So ARIA controls is an ID reference to the actual tab panel that this tab is associated with. Now this tab, this tab on the end has a role of tab. It's not selected, so ARIA selected is false, and it's associated with a folder hyphen four. Um, the tab panel that we have visible has a role of tab panel. It's ARIA hidden is false because it's visible. Uh, all of the other ones that you don't see would be ARIA hidden true, and it is labeled by folder hyphen one hyphen tab. So that's the, the inverse relationship back to the tab that controls it. Now when you put all of this together, this is what you end up getting. Um, I believe this was with N NVDA and Firefox. So that's pretty awesome. Just a little bit of extra markup, and all of a sudden we were able to take something that's a fairly complicated interface and make that usable to somebody who's using assistive technology. Um, now, you'll notice there was a little bit of a lag between what was going on with the focus caret, if you could see the focus caret, um, and the actual uh, text being read, and that's because the screen reader I had turned down so that we could actually understand it, and I could actually write subtitles for it. Um, otherwise, it would go by so fast that you wouldn't be able to actually read the subtitle um, the way that people would normally uh, interact with this. Um, so just a little bit of ARIA, and we can create much more accessible interfaces. So that's all I have for you for this kind of formal part of the presentation. I'm more than happy to answer questions. Um, people can tweet them at me if they want to after the live stream. I don't know if you've got some collected uh, that you want to, uh, to send over to me, but that's it on me. Thank you guys very much. We actually do have a question that came in uh, via Twitter. Uh, Kara Du asks, how do decisions regarding device testing differ between for-profit and government when for-profits are concerned with reaching customers and government with equity? So 
I don't know that there really is much of a difference or that there should be much of a difference between um, what government is doing in terms of testing and what corporations are doing in terms of testing. Obviously, at um, creating any project, you should be looking at what your users are actually using, and you should be optimizing for those devices. So if, if you are, let's say, designing an online application that is going to be used by a team of people either within your organization or you know, within the government department that you're in or something like that, and they're all on the same device, obviously you should optimize for that device. Um, but like with, I know there's a big push for the census um, to be BYOD, right? That all the census takers are going to bring their own devices in order to, to capture census data. So in that case, you probably want to create as broad a device testing experience as possible. Um, so there are a lot of organizations that have created open device labs um, or their own device lab where they've um, basically collected as many different kinds of devices as they can. Um, there are open ones that are free to use that you can just walk in and, and test in. And they'll give you your privacy if there's something that you need to test that you know, is not kind of open to the public. They'll give you, you know, a secure way to do that, typically. Um, but putting together an actual collection of devices to test on that are real world devices um, is definitely the way to go. And you want to test on as many of those as possible. There are lots of tools that are available to make that easily, easy to do. Um, like Winery is, is one example. Um, uh, Edge Inspect is really good, but that's mainly limited to um, iOS and Android devices. It also works with Kindle devices, which are Android based. Um, and then you've got things like Remote Preview, um, which is, is really good. It basically uses uh, push state to sync an, uh, an iframe that's pointing at, at your site to different, um, different devices. So that will work with older Blackberries and, and such that are not, um, that are not uh, capable of doing the more modern stuff. Uh, there's also Ghostery is another option um, for doing that. And there are a lot of emulators out there. There's like Browser Stack as a service that'll do emulation of I think 500 different devices or something of that nature. Um, and those can be really good. Um, there's really no substitute for having the actual device in your hand because you don't get a sense of what the actual processor speed is when you're virtual when you're virtualizing something, um, or what it's like like how frustrating it is to type something in. Like the the Obigo device that I mentioned uh, earlier that I got that this, that's a track phone. Um, it's actually, when the keyboard comes up, the, it's got a virtual keyboard. It has no physical keyboard. When the virtual key, keyboard comes up for typing in web addresses, it's T9. So I don't, I don't know if you guys remember T9 from back in the days of just having a keypad on your phone, on your like flip phone or something like that. But that's to do a C, I have to tap one three times on a virtual keyboard, which is really weird. But you, you don't necessarily see that stuff if you don't use the actual device, if you make assumptions about what, what certain things are. Um, so I don't know what exists within, um, within the government in terms of those sorts of resources. If there are some testing labs that you guys have that are available for other departments to use, um, if they're not, that certainly would be a wonderful thing to, to set up and to enable them to come in and use. Um, but yeah, they're, they're super handy. We have one that, that basically came out of a project that we were working on with a client. We already had a couple of devices. We probably had like a dozen or so devices that, that we had just collected over the years and doing our own testing. Um, but then when we worked on that project that we had like 1,400 devices that we had to deal with, um, we ended up purchasing almost 30 new devices. Um, and so we added those into our device lab. And now, and, and then when we moved into our new space, we opened that up to the public. So anybody in Chattanooga can come and actually use the open device lab. They can reserve time there and test on their um, as it were. Other questions? So two questions. The first one. OK. The first one is, in content design, folks generally aim to write for an eighth grade level. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, that can change depending on audience and intent. Yeah. Is there an app equivalent given current cell phone sales and usage data? So for example, aim for a 3.5 inch screen. Uh, that's a good question. I don't. I don't know that there are particular specs. Um, you can look at your own stats for a particular project. If it's not a new project, obviously, if it's an existing project, you can look and see what stuff you're get you're getting in terms of um, devices. But I would always say, 
like I, I tend to, to look at things from about 240 and up if I can make a pretty decent 240 pixel wide experience. Some words are going to be like a little bit awful. Um, but if I can cater to that a little bit, it creates more opportunities for people because who knows what's going what's gonna to come along next. I mean, somebody could be browsing the web on their Apple Watch. Somebody could be browsing the web um, on another form of smartwatch. I think there's, uh, for Pebble Time, for instance, there is a browser. And that is, uh, let's see, I want to say it's a 168 by 168 pixel screen. Um, so I mean, <laughs> the, the more flexibility you create, the more opportunity you have for your content to, to get to a particular person. Um, I mean, for the most part, I would say optimizing your designs for, for 320 and up is a good idea. But chasing specific screen resolutions, um, there are so many of them that it's just it's, it's a challenge. So creating the most support is a good way to go. And then figuring out which devices specifically you need to optimize for because you're seeing them in such high numbers. And then really making sure that it's it's really buttoned up for those particular devices. So maybe those devices happen to be, you know, an iPhone, or they happen to be a particular Android device, or um, something of that nature. But yeah, that's actually a good segue into my second question. So back when you saw the adoption of broadband increase back in the late 90s, there was talk of a digital divide, right? Those on dial versus those on broadband. So regarding your smartphone penetration March 2015 data, that was a somewhat significant difference between income level and cell phone choices. So the question one is, do you have any data around the socioeconomic breakdown of that? And two, do you think that this digital divide is a watch point regarding equal, and equal accessibility to information for all? So. To answer the first question, I don't have the specific data. Actually, my wife would, because she's running a digital equity initiative in Chattanooga, um, where they're actually dealing with a lot of this stuff. Um, in terms of the second, I mean, we, we've seen a lot of stats um, in terms of uh, at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. Uh, it starts to get into the 60% and higher are mobile only um, users of, of the web. Um, if they're using the web at all, what, what my wife's encountered is that there are a lot of people who don't understand why the web is relevant in their day-to-day -day lives. They may actually have a smartphone, but they may not use it for the web, so they don't understand what the value is, what opportunities they have for doing things online. And some of that is because that, that has traditionally not been open to them. Um, I mean, I think the, the education level, um, you know, the writing level from your previous question, um, actually comes into it a little bit as well, because when you're dealing with people who are ESL, for instance, um, they may require you know, a, a slightly lower reading level or a slightly lower use of jargon, for instance, or, or assumed domain knowledge. Um, and so you know, providing those opportunities and making sure that you know, the, the actual content is written in a way that your end users, your customers, however you want to refer to them, how they talk to one another, not just how you want to talk to them. Because when you talk to them, it's often you know, from kind of this position of authority, this position of you know, telling them what to do and stuff like that, whereas it should be more supportive and more like, let me help you to do what it is that you need to do, which is, I mean, I think that's one of the other successes of um, the overhaul of gov.uk, which a couple of us were talking about early on, is not only did they kill a ton of content that was just unnecessary, and they streamlined that to be only the important stuff, but also from a, a content standpoint, the, the writing of the content is very much more approachable, and it's on the level with the people uh, that they're trying to reach and speaking to them the way that they speak to one another, which is, is an accessibility concern, fundamentally. Um, so I think that, that that's something that we really need to be aware of, that we're not talking down to our audience, that we're actually talking to them as though we're sitting next to them in a room. Hi. So um, here at ATNF, we've started developing a series, documentation series we call guides, where we try mm -hmm. to say, here's, you know, accessibility here, the broad topics, things you need to think about, and links yep. to more resources. I was wondering if, when it comes specifically to um, you know, progressive enhancement, things like that, 
is there any kind of body of like an authoritative source of like collective wisdom that is emerging within the community or is that something that you know we can start developing our own guide for i mean you, you could certainly start developing your own guide um i wrote a book called adaptive web design which nick mentioned earlier that i actually included a, a progressive enhancement checklist at the back of that that kind of went through some basic things that if you always keep these in mind you'll you'll do good by your users um i'm currently wrapping up the second edition of that book, which will be out in December, um, with a completely revised checklist. So, I mean, it's it's certainly a starting point. I don't know that it's like thoroughly exhaustive, but it's a, a good way to go. And if you guys wanted to take that and use that as the basis for a progressive enhancement guide, I would happily give it to you. <laughs> um, because I, I do think having that sort of body of knowledge out there is really good. We in the web design community, we talk a lot about progressive en enhancement, and we talk about techniques that follow progressive enhancement, but we don't often talk about like what are the touchstones that you should be coming back to time and time again. So um, my book, and then Designing with Progressive Enhancement by the folks at the Filament Group up in Boston, um, which that one predated my book by a couple of years. I think that was like 2009, 2010, somewhere in there. Um, those are really the only books that have been written specifically about progressive enhancement and, and how to approach this stuff. Um, mine much more from a philosophy standpoint than from a technique standpoint because techniques come and go, um, but understanding fundamentally how the web works and how we can take advantage of the way these technologies are designed in order to create experiences that are tailored to our users. Um, was really kind of the point of what I was, what I've been doing, um, and I think that that's the sort of stuff that will serve people better in the long run. Hopefully that helped. Yeah, and your your uh, guides are really good. I was just I actually linked to the um, the one for how to run a GitHub project and documentation and stuff the other day. So it's good, good stuff. Any other questions? No? I have a, a question okay. around um, doing progress, progressive enhancement in like in, in a project and like from a project management or like project strategy perspective, like how do you integrate it? Cause I, I feel like um, a lot, you know, a lot of times it sort of like gets to the end of the project and you're like, okay, we've done this thing. Now let's test against, you know, you sort of right. hinted at that in your, in your presentation, um, you know, like device lab. Okay. Well, let's test, test it after it's first done. Yeah. Um, so how can you, you know, is it like a, is it partly a question of like scope, like how much do we try to do at, at, at one time um, and sort of like, you know, building up or how, how would you recommend take, uh, trying to integrate these principles into your project? Sure. So the way that, that we've had really good luck doing it is to, to really think about it from the beginning. So when you're, when you're thinking about your project um, and you're starting to, to conceive of what the different interfaces are that you're gonna be building, you know, the different wireframes that you're coming up with. During the wireframing process and during the, the pre-planning before the wireframing process, having conversations around it, maybe doing sketches like doing some IX maps around what we're in, intending the experience to be and then using those to drive the actual um, wireframes that we're creating and ac actually exploring each of those different experiences there. Um, so doing it early on in the planning process and having a, a diverse group of people at the table for doing that. So having content strategists, having obviously project managers there, um, having if you've got people who are like SEO and marketing folks or, or people who kind of fill that role within the government, I'm not sure how many of those sorts of people exist, but, um, and then obviously your designers and your developers and, and having them bring together different perspectives on something. And, and in some cases you could even do a little bit of like empathy role playing where you have somebody playing the, the part of somebody who is using a particular phone. And if you have a device lab and you're going in and you're discussing an existing project, maybe you give everybody a different device that's like a vastly different device. And that's the one that like that they have to, you know, for a day they spend time poking around the site before you do the redesign. And then they bring their perspective of using that site in that browser and advocating for people who, who have those experiences. Maybe you even have one person who turns off their monitor and uses a screen reader for a day trying to use the site. Like the, those sorts of things can really be helpful for building up empathy with the end users who are in those same sorts of situations. Um, and yeah, starting that early on in the process because the longer you wait towards the end of the, the process to make those sorts of adjustments, the more expensive that becomes. And there are a lot of people who, who talk about it, uh, about progressive enhancement as though it's this big expense to adding into a project and what we found is that 
it maybe adds 30% to a project initially when progressive enhancement isn't part of the way that you work. But as it becomes more kind of part and parcel of how you do things, it adds no time and no extra money to the project. And then you have the flexibility of being able to reach 1,400 new devices in you know, a matter of weeks as opposed to months. Um, so the, the dividends over time are, are pretty um, phenomenal. And, but it all, it all comes from actually approaching it from a philo philosophical standpoint and from a planning standpoint and not just from a where the rubber meets the road development standpoint. Um, I mean, if somebody's like a lone wolf in the, in the team, that they're the only one that believes in progressive enhancement, they can absolutely make sure that the stuff that they're building is progressively enhanced and like try and sneak that stuff in as they get opportunities to do so. Um, but it, it's much better to try and get the entire organization behind it. Um, the, the end results are much better. So, and there are a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of arguments that you can make in terms of long-term maintainability, in terms of obviously reach, as I've talked about a bunch, um, but there's a lot of PR opportunities around reaching other people. You're also creating a lot more, um, you know, especially within like the private sector, when you're trying to sell to people, you're creating a lot more opportunities to sell to people and you know, that, that sort of stuff. You're not limiting yourself to a select audience that's like you. Um, so yeah, there are lots, lots and lots of arguments to be made uh, to try and encourage people to do that up beyond just, it's the right thing to do, which, you know, people rarely gravitate towards that as a, a way. Especially if you're kind of, it's a, a client or a stakeholder, like this is how we should be yeah. designing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Anything else? No? All good? All right. Great. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Thanks again.